Part 1 You will hear a student called Janet talking on the phone to the manager of a sports centre about a job. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, White Water Sports Centre. Hello, I wanted to inquire about a job at the centre. Right, I'll just put you through to the manager. Hello, Steve Thompson speaking. Hello, um, my name's Janet Willis. Um, I'm looking for a part-time job and I saw an ad saying that you have some vacancies. I was wondering what sort of people you're looking for. Well, at present we're looking for a part-time pool attendant. I don't know if you're interested in that. Oh yes, definitely. OK. Well, have you done this sort of job before? Oh yes, I've spent the last three summers working for children's summer camps, so I did a lot of pool supervision. And I'm actually a sports student. Water sports is my special area. OK. Well, no need to ask if you can swim then. No, I'm certainly not afraid of the water. So what does the job at the pool involve? You'd mainly be responsible for supervising the swimmers. We have to watch them all the time, obviously, in case of accidents. So you'd have regular shifts there. OK. Then, as well as that, you'd have to look after the equipment that's used by the beginners' classes. Right. And would I be involved in teaching them at all? I'd be quite interested in that. Well, they have their own instructor, so that's not really part of the job. The attendance job does involve taking regular water quality tests, but you wouldn't be involved in cleaning the pool or anything like that. OK. And the ad said you wanted someone just twice a week? Yes, that's right. Can I choose which days? Uh... <laughs> Well, if you'd rung up earlier, you could have done, but I'm afraid it's got to be Mondays and Wednesdays. We got someone for Tuesdays and Thursdays, and the weekends are already fully staffed. Is that going to be a problem for you? No, that should be all right. And the ad said it was evening work, right? Yeah, you start at 6, and the pool closes at 9.30, but you wouldn't get away until 10 by the time you've checked the lockers and changing rooms. Fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And how much do you pay? The basic hourly rate is $15, but it would go up to 19 for someone with the right qualifications. Well, I've got life-saving certificates and first aid qualifications. Oh. Well, with that and your experience, you'd probably get the maximum rate then. Obviously, you'd have to come along for an interview if you're interested. Oh, it sounds just the job I'm looking for. Shall we fix a time for the interview now? OK. Uh, it's Janet, isn't it? Yep, Janet Willis. How about Friday morning, Janet? Around 11? Oh, sorry. I have lectures, but I could make the afternoon. 2pm? Fine. And can I just check on where you are? Is it Finden Avenue? No, it's 23 to 27 Farnden Avenue. That's F-A-R-N-D-O-N. It's off Eastgate. East Gate. Fine. I'll look forward to meeting you then. OK. So if you need to phone me before then, you can get through to me directly on 053210. Is there anything I need to bring along to the interview? Well, you do need to fill in an application form. I'll put one in the post for you, so you can fill that in and bring it along. You don't want me to post it back to you? No. Just remember to bring it along with you. 
What about references? Should I bring any? Nah, but do have your certificates with you when you come. We need to see those. Great. Thanks very much then. I'll see you on Friday. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tutor and some students discussing choosing courses at a college. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. As you know, this week you choose your modules for the first year of study. So this introductory meeting is aimed at helping you make informed choices. I think the best way to do this is on a question and answer basis. So who'd like to start? Pat. Um, yes, there's something I've been wondering about. Will my choice affect my career opportunities? Hmm. Well, for most students, the choice of Level 1 modules won't be crucial in terms of a later career. In fact, many graduate level jobs will accept graduates from a range of degree courses. Employers will often be at least as interested in how well a student has performed academically and how the whole experience of university has developed the student as a person, as in the detail of the course options chosen. Selecting modules that will interest you and in which you think you will be particularly successful is therefore also likely to make good sense in career terms. On certain degree courses, though, module choice can be important. This applies mainly to vocational courses, where the degree confers an accredited professional training as well as university education. Usually the modules students are required to take will include all those needed to meet those professional requirements. Your academic department, in this case chemical and process engineering, and the university's career service will be able to advise you and will be pleased to help you sort out anything you're not certain about. Right. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. I'd like to ask a few things about the Applied Chemical Engineering module. Fine. What would you like to know? Well, apart from the work on practical engineering, what other topics are covered? Some that might surprise you. One that students always seem to like includes interviewing techniques, presentation skills and producing written reports. Hmm. They sound interesting. How are they taught? Through lectures, practical classes and personal tutorials. Applied chemical engineering lasts all year, of course, so there's plenty of time. And what about assessment? Through project work, usually, or dissertation. Not exams as such. Is that the same for the information technology part of the module? Yes. Things like word processing and learning to create spreadsheets are tested in a similar way on this module. That's not the case in some other modules, is it? No, it isn't. 
Are you thinking of any in particular? Yes, I'm considering doing fluid mechanics. Ah. The work on flow analysis looks interesting and I like the look of some of the other topics too. So how is that module tested? That's one of those which still uses written exams. Uh, the sit-down formal type, I'm afraid. Oh, that doesn't matter. I quite like that kind as it happens. <laughs> uh, Pat, you've got a question. Um, yes. I was wondering about Science 1 in chemical engineering. How is that organised? Um, it's a bit different from other modules, isn't it? Yes. It aims to give the necessary basis of physics and biology for those students who haven't studied the relevant subjects at A-level or equivalent. In practice, it means that students who have already studied physics are excused the physics lectures, while those who've done biology are exempt from attending the biology lectures. In the second part of the module, you're assessed on your project work in one of those subjects. And does the teaching approach differ too? Yes, particularly in one respect. You're encouraged to learn by working out the solutions to problems for yourself. Hmm. I like the sound of that. OK. Anything else? Yes. I believe it's possible to do a modern language as part of the course. Can you tell me a bit about the Spanish 1A module? Certainly. The main emphasis in 1A is on understanding and speaking, but students also learn to carry out some straightforward reading and writing tasks. Basic aspects of grammar are also introduced and practised. The module comprises 36 hours of class contact, mainly in tutorial groups of 16 to 20, and students are expected to do approximately 64 hours of private study. It sounds interesting. I did some Spanish at the Cervantes Institute last year. Uh, passed an exam, in fact. Ah, I'm afraid that means you can't do 1A. Oh. The regulations say this module may not be taken by students with a qualification in Spanish, though you could do 1B. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a radio program in which the speakers discuss the importance of looking after old people in winter. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer the questions. Nobody likes cold weather, but for old people it can be particularly uncomfortable and dangerous. They can become cold without even noticing it. To keep warm, they may need help from friends and neighbours like you. To find out how we can help, we've invited a representative from the Social Service Department at the Town Hall to talk about the Winter Warmth Code campaign. Mr. Hastings, can I first ask you why it is so important to keep an eye on elderly people during cold weather such as we've been having lately? Yes. There are two main reasons. First, the old suffer from the cold more than the rest of us. They're not as active or strong as you and me, and it's harder for them to keep warm. This can lead to all sorts of complications. They have less resistance to infection. The quality of their lives is badly affected, and in extreme cases, they may need to be hospitalized. According to the newspapers, old people are actually dying of the cold. Is this true? I'm afraid it is. 
I said before there were two main reasons why we should keep an eye on old people. Well, the other major problem is that so many pensioners cannot afford to heat their homes properly. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. They may already be living in difficult circumstances. Then, in an exceptionally cold winter such as this one, they may just not have enough money to pay for the extra heating necessary. It seems terrible that in a society such as ours this should be happening. It is. And what the Winter Warmth Code campaign aims to do is to bring this problem to the attention not only of the government, but of everybody else in society. We all have a duty towards our old people to make sure that they do not suffer in this cold weather. So now to the practical side of things. What can we do to help? Well, we all know someone old, a relative maybe, a neighbor, someone living round the corner. We should adopt that person and make sure that we spare a few minutes every day to check that everything is okay. Make sure, even if the old person is not actually ill, that he or she is not suffering. Check when you go inside that the house or flat doesn't feel cold to you. It's a good idea to try to feel some part of their body, like their face or hands. Old people can become cold without even noticing it, you know. Okay. And if a person is too poor to afford to heat the house or flat? The best thing, then, is for the old person to live in one room only and to make sure that that one room is warm. Check that the bed is on an inside wall. Move it yourself if necessary. Check the room for drafts. A lot of cold air gets into the room through old windows or badly fitting doors. Is food important? Yes. Make sure that the old person is eating well. You could help by cooking for them or doing the shopping. Remember, a good hot meal a day makes a big difference. Also, make sure that they are well dressed. Old people need to wear more layers of clothes than we do, particularly at night. One last question, Mr. Hastings. Is there nothing the state can do to help? Oh, yes, indeed. Contact your town hall to find out about local organizations already involved in this kind of work. If there is a local Meals on Wheels service, for instance, you could get your adopted old person on the list. Then, of course, there are also many state benefits which an old person could be entitled to and which he or she doesn't know about, and which therefore he or she is not claiming. An extra problem here is that it can often be complicated, and old people don't like going to Social Security offices to fill in forms and all that. You can help by finding out for them what possibilities exist for claiming a little extra money from the government, then applying for it for them. That little extra could make all the difference. Yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Hastings, thank you for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will now hear a speaker talking about student loans. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Thanks for turning up today and welcome to this short talk on student loans. What you'll hear from me today are a few starting points, which should guide you in the right direction for what is suited for you. I'm assuming that most of you have an account at a bank or building society that you can draw funds from. These funds will either be your own or through a loan you may have with the bank. You may even have a credit card you can use. If you don't have a bank account, I suggest you open one with one of the major banks. It's the best option as you will find major banks have more outlets. Within the city and in close proximity to the university are HSBC in City Plaza, Barclays in Ragdale Square, National Westminster in Preston Park and Halifax in Hope Street. At this stage, I just want to inform international students that not all the services available for resident students will be available to you. As international students, you need to provide documentation stating that you have funds available to see you through the duration of your study. Different banks have different policies so search out the one that will benefit you the most. You will also need to provide a photocopy of your passport and certification of your enrolment in the university. The most common way of taking out a student loan is either through the university or through a banking institution. If you decide to go with the university, again, you need to supply a certification of enrolment and passport if you're an international student, or, if you're a resident, you will only need the enrolment details. One word of warning is that you need to be clear on the interest you will be paying on your loan. The interest level through some universities is almost as much as the loan itself, so if you borrow £10,000, you might have to pay back close to 20 Also, with student loans through the university, you have a limited time to pay them back and this time is not flexible. You might have only one year. You might have five. As I said, different universities have different policies. This university, for example, has an interest rate of 23.5%. It's quite high, but not as high as many of the other larger universities. The other option is to take out a loan through your bank you will find that most banks will have lower interest rates than the university. They average roughly between 14.5 to 18.5%. Banks also give you an option of over how many years you want to make repayments. You can basically choose to pay it back in a year or in 10, even more if you are finding it difficult. Make sure you have an account with the bank you decide to go with. Either a current account or a savings account is enough. With either of these accounts, you can use your card to make withdrawals and deposits from automatic teller machines at any time and make payments over the internet if you choose. You can also use Maestro, one of the systems which automatically take the money from your account at a time that you have specifically stated and deposits it into a nominated account of your choice. You might decide to have £150 taken out each month, and each month this is what will happen. Also, check what fees apply with what services. Some services are free of charge, but they are few and far between. OK, so that's all from me. If there are any questions related to what I've covered today, please raise your hand.
That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.